I think the what best thing we can do is to try and get a nice conversation going about on, on this and sort of have some real interaction with the, with the panels and so on. So feel, feel free to come a bit closer and think about some of these questions. Uh, my name is Roger Bingham, by the way, and um, I'm in the Sanofsky lab, the computational neurobiology lab over at Salk. I run a thing called the Science Network, which is an online public square with about 1,100 videos on it. We did some stem cell meeting on the Mesa, Beyond Belief meetings and so on, and recently started a, a center within the Institute for Neural Computation called the Collaboratory, which has a tagline where science gets cultured and the culture gets science for the simple reason that we still feel that there's a major problem and a fairly sizable chasm between the creators and the consumers of science and technology. So meetings like this that are bringing together different disciplines are just hugely important and I, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to help out and thank Gert and the other organizers for what they've been doing. Um, rather than my going through this, um, and so let me tell you a story, a very short story. There is a mushroom. Sitting on top of the mushroom is a blue caterpillar smoking a hookah. And there's a little girl comes by whose name is Alice. And the caterpillar says, Who are you? And Alice says, I could have answered that pretty easily this morning, but I've been so many sizes since then, I don't think I really know anymore. <laughs> and then at the end of the conversation, the caterpillar says, what size do you want to be? So these are the two caterpillar's questions. They're about the self. And instead of asking, um, instead of introducing these folks, I'm just going to ask them, who are you? Fadl, well, let me start with you at this end. Cheers. Uh, Roger. <laughs> Pleasure. Is this on? There we go. <laughs> well, my name, my given name, I don't know even, I'm trying to, like, do I need, I should probably be existential and philosophical here, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, my name is Fado Zidane. I am a, uh, a, uh, a father uh, and a cognitive neuroscientist, I guess, in that order. Uh, and I am studying uh, consciousness by studying pain and appreciating the neurobiology of self. And we'll be getting into the world of compassion and mindfulness, cultivating awareness through a, a spectrum of practices from pharmacologic to uh, non-pharmacologic. And I prefer to be as small as possible. Okay. <laughs> Um, my name is Mateusz Gola. Um, I'm originally from Poland, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm a scientist uh, and uh, also entrepreneur. And uh, uh, what does it mean for me? It means that I like to solve problems, and mostly the problems which are related to mental health, uh, clinical neuroscience. Um, I'm particularly interested in addictions and in all kinds of uh, technologies which help to address the addiction-related problems better. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know actually what kind, what size I would like to be. Well, that, uh, that can be a metaphor for what, what kind. What's your Dream. What, what would be the outlook that you dream of? of, of, of what would be a, 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 a wonderful mm -hmm. achievement for you? Um, yeah, so definitely I would like to help people stay sober and uh, quit addiction more efficiently uh, because right now a lot of people suffer from that. Uh, but all the technologies developed on the way can help also others as many people as possible, so in terms of size, hmm. goes big. Excellent. So my name's Tim Mullen. Um, I'm a um, computational neuroscientist, I guess is what I would probably refer to myself 
as predominantly. Um, I'm also, um, you know, I've been a computer scientist in the past. I love the intersection of computing and the brain, the mind, how we can use advances in machine learning, computing, computing infrastructure to help solve some of the really tricky problems about how we interface with the brain and body and ultimately with our minds to uh, really increase thriving. I'm very interested in like increasing human thriving, human potential, what it means to be human. Um, for many years, I actually was here at the Institute for Neural Computation and Swartz Center for many years, where we developed a lot of software, I worked on the team uh, that developed EEG Lab and many tools that many labs use, and um, I've been increasingly interested over the last few years in how we can help make it possible for many others out there who want to innovate in the what is really an emerging neurotechnology space to be able to have access to the state of the art of what labs have access to um, in science and technology um, and be able to plug into those validated tools and capabilities. And so uh, I have a company that, that does that. Um, and uh, I also uh, enjoy doing research uh, very actively. And I'm also a musician uh, sometimes, moonlighting. Um, so if you want to jam sometime, hit me up. Um, the what size would I like to be? I I would like to be growing. I think that's the size I'd like to be. I'm interested in dynamics, things that change. So I don't think I'd be comfortable with any size, but I'd like to be growing. Okay. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Hari Garudadri. Uh, you can call me just Hari. That's simple. Um, I'm an inventor, an engineer, a scientist and a self-proclaimed gourmet chef. And I made good money from all of them, except as a cook, not yet. Um, so I used to work, I was in the industry all my career. About six years ago, I left Qualcomm after a 16-year stint and decided to work on healthcare devices. And that's what I have been doing for the last six years at UCSD, and that's what I'll talk a little bit more later. Thank you. Oops, is it on? Yeah. Uh, Esra Tesali, um, I guess I am the rare mushroom here. <laughs> I'm a clinician, a uh, clini physician scientist. Uh, I work at the University of Chicago. My training is in pulmonary medicine and sleep medicine, also um, endocrinology. Uh, I, uh, my research has been on um, the impact of sleep, sleep disorders on cardiovascular risk, metabolic risk. Um, where I want to be is really, I'm, I'm fortunate actually to be in this audience because a lot of times as clinicians we don't get access to um, this whole new technology, cutting edge technology. And I believe that there's a big gap uh, between the, the whole fantastic work going on in the bioengineering field and uh, what clinician needs at the bedside. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here to be able to translate some of this technology to, to real life. So where I want to be, of course, the reason I chose medicine is to help people improve people's lives uh, day in and out. And uh, one little story here, the reason I went to sleep medicine is because of a French um, clinician investigator who passed away uh, this past year, Christian Guimino, who uh, used to be at Stanford, was a neurologist who um, basically discovered sleep apnea back in the day uh, in, a, in a child. And the, the only available treatment back then was tracheostomy. And, um, you know, I got really inspired by his work. And to, to the day he, he actually passed away, he was a great educator, moved our field forward, and he, he was a great scientist. There's another mic at the end, Florian, as well. Hi. Oh, okay. Thanks. So, hello. I am Florian Chapoteau. I am from France, <laughs> as you can notice. <laughs> I would never have guessed. Really? No. <laughs> never. So I'm a neuroscientist by uh, training, and uh, my research in the beginning um, was involved in characterizing the brain uh, activity, uh, not during sleep, but during uh, wake and over time, during the nictamaran, how it uh, fluctuates uh, spontaneously. Uh, 
um, because when I started at the time, there were uh, the, the, the tools available to perform some uh, quantitative assessment of brain activity in an awake subject was really scarce. I had to move to the field of uh, biosignal processing to develop tools to be able to carry on uh, and um, perform my research. So I have developed several tools uh, that um, have have become commercial tools and distributed to uh, people involved in the sleep-wake research. So I have always been interested by um, all the technology developed um, that can improve the data collection, well, the collection of uh, biosignals that can help in uh, really uh, assessing the vigilance uh, status or the sleep-wake states. And uh, it's uh, delightful to be in such an environment because there are so many things uh, going on uh, and various uh, development in that uh, technologies that uh, I can see there will be many, many improvements uh, in, uh, and this will, this will revolutionize the, the way uh, sleep studies are conducted today in the lab and this may end up in a, becoming a very, very simple uh, process for a lot of people who so far had to wait uh, uh, a long period of time before to get, uh, to get uh, diagnosed in the, in the sleep lab. Voilà. Okay. So uh, one of the things I'd like to find, uh, set some context here and then get some answers from you on this one is, um, so how old is the universe? Th allegedly 13.8 billion years, right? Um, 3.8 billion years of star stuff, 6 million years since the origin of bipedal apes, 200,000 years since Homo sapiens emerged, 2,500 years since Plato and the Buddha, 500 years since the burgeoning of modern science, 200 years since the beginning of a series of industrial and technological revolutions. So we have information traveling at the relentless pace of digital communication. We're now running Homo sapiens as a brand at breakneck speed. Why is this all happening now? Why is so much happening, literally in the last, I would say, 50 years, really since this, a lot of the brain stuff started happening? And I, I call those things EPSCAN, evolutionary, psychological, social, cognitive, affective neuroscience. And the way that that is intersecting with engineering is staggering. And it has staggeringly good things and staggeringly bad things that we have to be worried about all the time. Um, and I sometimes go back and think about Jeremy Bentham and you know, the, his panopticon, the, the visual, um, the, the being under surveillance all the time. And here we are again 200 years later being under surveillance all the time, sort of. But there's a bright side as well, and we've, we've learned some of the bright side at this meeting. So can you, um, sorry for the little speech, but could you add something to this from your own perspective? Some, uh, you know, am I, should I be removed at this point? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> Who would like to speak? Who? So is the question, is technology helping us or harming Why us? Why did it, yes, that, that's one question. The other one is, um, given, given how rapidly things have happened now, where do you see it going? And so, then we can talk to you now. about this as well. Uh, and then I'll leave it to colleagues here to, to answer the other things. But on just the why now, um, I mean, so there's this, there's this assumption that, that somehow the advances in neurotechnology and neuroscience that we're seeing and the advances in computing are maybe one is predicated on the other. But actually, the two are co-evolving um, primarily because of a reciprocal benefit that they gain from each other. I would say that the advances in, com in computing have predicated our ability now to make big breakthroughs in neuroscience because of imaging technology that we now have access to, computational technology that allows to process that data, and material science uh, that's advancing to a point where we can now you know, put implants inside people's brains and record activity at higher and higher resolution. All of that being predicated on a wave of essentially computer, computing technology and material science that's been exponentially increasing um, for some years. But now, as we start to learn more about what's happening in the brain, it starts to feed back into how we design our computing systems, artificially intelligent systems and such. And I think we're starting to see a reciprocality between these two co-exponentially evolving fields that will be for, I think, generations, many generations to come 
um, inextricably entwined, um, the computing revolution and the neuro revolution. Um, so why now? I think it has a lot to do with uh, the birth of the information age and the computing age as the initial catalyst for why we're seeing this now flourishing in neurosciences as the initial kind of starting point. That's my thinking on that, but others may have a different opinion. Okay. Don't, don't, don't yeah. ignore me, just talk amongst yeah. yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of agree with that. Um, I just would like to add that it's not just now. Uh, engineering has always had a very solid impact in taking care of our own, in, in healthcare, from the stethoscope where people could actually see inside the body, listen to the body, and make sense. And, and the other cool thing that I like to talk about is the pulse oximeter. Now, you cannot really measure oxygen, and anesthetists were really struggling in the OR to kind of titrate the amount of uh, anesthesia. Then the photodiodes and the electronics, we shine light and measure the other side, and then back calculate what would be the amount of oxygen using just a table lookup. That's a very smart sensor. Uh, in my own field, the, the field in which I was involved for 16 years, uh, the, the, the smartphones, uh, it is actually convergence of six different disciplines, engineering and computer science, that gave us the smartphones that, again, very quickly evolved into what we call the, the Internet of Things. Um, <clears throat> So engineers have always been taking what's available and apply at least some group of engineers to science and uh, medicine, and then there are other people, consumer electronics, video games, so we leave them aside. Um, so the, the last point I want to make on that one is it's the economies of scale. There are um, more people in the world with access to a smartphone than safe drinking water or a toothbrush or safe toilets. So it's, you can do a lot more, a lot cheaply, so it's natural that we leverage all the technologies that you're talking about um, for progressing our own discipline. Mm -hmm. um. I can add on top of, of what you said uh, that, for example, in, in my field, in the field of um, addiction uh, research and uh, also for, uh, like all the healthcare related to addiction, one of the very big issue is uh, relapse rate, and uh, it's like on average about 75 percent after completed treatment during the first year, uh, and this is among people who really want to stay sober. And uh, for years, a big problem was that we were treating addiction as a homogeneous construct, uh, as something very similar across subjects, and providing similar treatment to everyone. Uh, and thanks to such devices like smartphones, which are uh, cheap, available, everyone has them, uh, or these days also all these smart bands, uh, smart watches, uh, which everyone can buy, they are cheaper and cheaper, more available. Uh, we were able um, to collect a huge data set of 18,000 uh, addicts uh, in the very longitudinal measurements with ecological momentary assessments, so we can assess them every day, a few times a day in the natural situations. Uh, and with such databases, we can see much more. Uh, this is a big data. Uh, so we can see that within the same type of addiction, we have multiple clusters of people uh, who are triggered by different things, by different scenarios. And it opens the way to more personalized medicine uh, for the like real solutions for problems which were unanswered for, for a long time because of the lack of uh, big data uh, bases uh, and it was impossible to collect such data because there was no devices. But now we have 
everything coming together, we can only add more sensors, have more rich data sets, and answer not only questions about addiction, but any, any mental disorder. And the other, other the reverse uh, of the coin, you have some new problem that's been created and people becoming addicted to technology, you know? Yeah, that's right. And the question is, you know, where is this trade-off? To which extent, to which extent the technology I, I, helps us, to which it creates new problems? I, I, I would also build on that, that um, nowadays in the pediatric field, there's a new diagnosis. It's called Internet Gaming Disorder. It is official. There is a there is a disease code for that, and it's true that this whole new technology. I think we we should be able to control it better, um, you know, uh, wisely use it, uh, because there is definitely, as we've heard from many many talks over the past two days, that um, there's a good interaction between how the brain is st uh, gets stimulus and how certain regions are activated. And apparently some of these people who are developing video games are targeting more of um, you're modulating their computational science that they uh, target more reward providing uh, brain areas when people play video games. And, and our, our kids are certainly affected. And to, to link it to my area of research, m metabolic disorders, there's a huge epidemic of obesity among children as well because they're no longer active, they're no three-dimensional, they're in front of a screen, they're on their couch, and this is unmatchable pleasure that you can offer them any outdoor activity, they would still prefer video games. So I think uh, as a, as a um, I, if we want a healthy next generation, we want to be very careful how we utilize it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and it's not only video games, because also in new ICD-11, International Classification of Disorders, uh, there are things like compulsive sexual behavior disorder, where the po internet pornography is um, a huge, um, huge problematic behavior. Also among kids, uh, the average onset of uh, watching, according to our studies, is nine and a half years old. Um, there is also more and more studies showing the binge watching of things like YouTube, uh, all the video streamings uh, like TikTok in China, it's a really big thing. Uh, I don't know if anyone is using TikTok here, but it's not, don't, don't confuse it with TED Talks. It's a, tic, <laughs> it's a TikTok, but you can also binge watch that TED Talks, yeah, both. Uh, or Netflix, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. We, we still don't know how many more things we can create which will be problematic. Yeah, well, but, but, but how does all this work? I mean, I, a couple of you know this story, but I, I was doing a, working with a colleague, um, doing a little two-camera piece at the Salk Institute a little while ago, and it was about some of these topics, and I was basically saying to the camera, this is the Salk Institute, and if you didn't know how to get here, it would be very simple for you because you could just use this. It's a GPS, a global positioning system. You could find your way here very easily. But what if you had something else that I call an MPS, which is a moral positioning system that was consistently and continually telling you if you were doing right or wrong? Would you want one? <laughs> Cut. So. Uh, these these ethical issues, uh, I mean, uh, have been raised. Uh, you know, that, that they're really important. They're, they're, they're tremendously important. How do you? Uh, the, we just did a meeting on conscience. Pat Churchill's book. Um, again, how do you tell right from wrong? What is right from wrong? I mean, then we're back to Bentham again and utilitarianism and so on and so forth. But a lot of these issues do come up. Um, and the intersection, the, the interaction between scientists and philosophers and historians and engineers seems to me enormously important because the engineers deliver the truth test, right? It, it, does it work? The truth test is in engineering, but before you get there, do you want it to work and do you want it to do those kind of things? Um, and it's, it's tricky to know how some of these things work out. Yeah, Florian, I was just reading a paper of yours the other day. Um, nicotine increases sleep spindle activity. And I thought, what, does this mean I should smoke before I go to bed? <laughs> well, 
Well, uh, which increases memorization. So all of these things are, 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 are difficult and confusing to get out to a, a larger public. And the, the ethics has obviously now become a very important part of it. And certainly here at UCSD, um, there's the Institute for Practical Ethics, there's the ethics and technologies stuff going on all the time. Um, could you just comment well, on this? Well, in I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not you believe Andy. that we need to regulate no, after this, you. This, these ethical behaviors or these ethical dilemmas. In other words, obviously right and wrong is predicated by the individual or cultural, right? It's all relative. So who are we to decide and even, even state that question about whether or not we should put a gauge or a meter on morality or ethics? Because just the very nature of, of delegating ethics and morality puts you already on a higher ground from everyone else. Right, and the, the difficulty with, with that sort of thing is, I mean, as again, going back to Jeremy Bentham and utilitarianism, he, here's a man who's talking in 1769 or whatever it is about a hedonic calculus, trying to figure out what value to assign to certain things to see how you could maximize your happiness. Um, I was making a play on that, obviously. Uh, since I used to walk past Jeremy Bentham at University College every day when I was at college because he's in the, in the octagon there, so it must have stuck with me. But in terms of assessing all those things, do you, should you be paying attention to philosophers who will say, well, actually, it's forget the utilitarianism. Let's look at the consequentialist ethics. And then there's the fact consequent. And there's all these various versions of this. And now we have effective altruism. A lot of the younger philosophers talking about effective altruism and how to solve the the problem of losing the planet, global warming, da 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 da, da. Do, you, do you spend time thinking about these things when you're, when you're putting your programs together and you're... I definitely... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> But I, I want to go back to something that you were asking and, and uh, your comment. What is right? What is wrong? Do we regulate that? And there is a chapter in, in one of the Indian... Um, <clears throat> books called Bhagavad Gita, the, the third chapter called Karma Yoga. And, and the, the main thesis of that whole chapter is we all know what is right and what is wrong. It's innate in all of us and that never changes either with time or with space. And if you're doing something against your conscience, when your conscience tells you that this is your purpose, that this is what you should be doing. And if you go against it, that is always wrong. Of course, this is a much, much longer discussion, and I spent <laughs> months and months thinking about it. But the point, all, all I want to say is we all have it inside us. And in the olden days, people were using meditation and mindfulness to kind of take people to that particular location. It has to come from within you. You so, cannot... Hari, I have to interrupt you because I wholeheartedly disagree with you. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't believe in right and wrong, and I don't think that exists. And I, there is a person sitting in Washington, D.C. right now that believes that what he is doing is right. And I could probably raise your hand if you believe what he's doing is wrong. But I, I promise you, he thinks he's right and righteous. But what we do not know is whether he really thinks it is right mm -hmm. or if he's doing it for his immediate personal uh, near-term gain. I, I, I cannot look into another person. Mm -hmm. All I can say is, for me, I have chosen things that my conscience said, hurry, you shouldn't be doing this. And sometimes I listen, sometimes I don't, and that's how I judge myself. On the days that I do the right thing, it fits well. I mean, we are all human, right? Complicated. Isn't sometimes it? the question may be do you have any idea of the outcome of your action? And uh, for sure, right. if you don't ask yourself that question, well, then right or wrong, yeah. you, you don't you know, you have no idea. But, yeah. but if you are someone interested with moral, at least you want to try to ask yourself if you, what you are doing will, will, will do either good or, or bad. And then I tell I, 
Yeah. Tell you what, let's just get, there's a few hands up here, so let's just get a few comments Let, let me, here, let me then, comment on that real quick, And then, and then I'll come back to you, Bruce. You had a comment? Let, yeah. let me briefly bring this back real quick before, because I think we can spend an hour talking about morality, and, and, and that's a fascinating conversation, but to relate it directly to the question of neuroscience, um, yeah. Uh, this issue, I think at the heart of everything here, is not an issue of you know, right and wrong and morality, but an issue of agency. Mm -hmm. So what I hear when I hear about the fact that, for instance, by learning more about the brain, we can design games that can compel people to play the games more, is not an issue of right and wrong. It's an issue of control and agency. Mm -hmm. When you know enough about a human to compel them to, to enact certain behaviors or to carry out certain actions, where their ability to understand and weigh the consequences of that and whether they're in their benefit or not in their benefit, at that point you have now removed agency from that person and control no longer resides in the individual. If it ever did, it, it no longer resides in that individual, it resides in somebody else. I think what we have to be asking ourselves is whether the technologies we're building are being designed to preserve agency and control at the fundamental human level where mm -hmm there aren't external forcing factors that are so powerful and so intelligent about what our actions are and what, what will make us act in a certain way that we, um, we essentially lose the ability to actually act under our own free will. And that's, a, that's under, the, you're, you're talking about the illusion or the, the illusion. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can philosophize okay. for an hour and uh, three hours about free will and whether it exists or not. But insofar free as years. the, free the, years. the <laughs> degree or, or, or 3,000 years, um, <laughs> but uh, insofar as, as we accept this premise that there is some, some agency and some notion of, of freedom of choice, that is something we have to look carefully at, how technology is removing that agency. Yeah, yeah, if we can preserve that, then at least we're back to the same <coughs> discourses we've had for thousands of years about what may be right and wrong, but right. we still have a choice but here's in the a, here's, a, here's a typical story out of, out of I agree. Off, 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 the, off the internet today. Can an AI fact checker solve India's fake news problem? So now there's this huge problem in India, you know, billions of people, I mean, there are, it's, a, it's a terrible story of people dying here because of fake news and so on and so forth. We know that this happens everywhere. Absolutely. Uh, memetics is something I think a lot about. Um, memes travel like viruses, carry information, propagate subconsciously through systems, and carry ideas that modify people's behavior. And they're hosted by people and propagated out in other sort of subversive ways. Memes can be used for good or bad. Um, having sort of anti-memetic software running in your mind, which mindfulness or other training may allow you to kind of gauge, is this information making me feel this way because of X, Y, Z, or because of A, B, C, you know? That's the kind of thing that allows, say, like fake news and other information that may be designed or engineered or organically merged to manipulate people to prevent it from having sort of cascading effects throughout a system. So. Right, but would you, would you say, for example, from uh, being so much involved in this, I should ask Gert as well, would you say that there was um, a clear understanding within the, within the engineering community at large of these kinds of issues and, and efforts to, to resolve well, it? Uh, so I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question directly, but I will comment that it's not just <laughs> NIH-funded uh, graduate students who have to take ethics courses. All engineers in the United States at the undergraduate level have to have some instruction in ethics. And just as a reminder, I think we have some major societal accomplishments in ethics called the FDA, uh, IACUC, <laughs> IRBs. Um, some might even go to the Constitution of the United States, this kinds of thing. So we're, we're not without accomplishments. I'll, I'll throw in one anecdote that is more humorous. When I was on faculty at the University of Illinois, all of a sudden our governor <clears throat> forced all employees of the state to take ethics tests online. And one of the amusing things was that you couldn't finish it in under uh, five minutes or you had to take it over again because you didn't spend enough time on it. <laughs> but the governor who forced us all to do this was uh, Blagojevich, <laughs> who was in jail within the year. <laughs> do you have any, as, as the incoming chair, president of this organization, do you have any thoughts on this as we're going along? Okay, for when it comes to ethics, I believe it's very important, but fundamentals to me, everything starts from your family, being honest, don't lie, respect other people, don't abuse other people, promote women and minority. That's my definition for ethics. <laughs>
Now, who, who had some other? We'll just take a couple more and then come back to the panel again. Steve, you had a comment? John? You just pass that forward. Thank you. My comment was that uh, you're not born with an educated conscience. Uh, it's a cultural phenomenon. It's maybe 10% oxytocin, and the rest is how you're brought up, your family, how you were treated, and uh, how you've seen models of how other people are treated. So you can't just depend on your individual conscience for uh, legislating these kinds of things. Um, I guess that's the, the main point. I think you're right. So I think that maybe brings the point that technology if designed in a adaptive fashion, could manage or dictate what's ethical and or not because the human uh, is so erroneous. I had I was speaking with a friend of mine, I'll make this very quick, um, as this German guy and he was, he was infatuated with, pla with planes and he told me uh, the difference between the pilot preference for Boeing versus Airbus. This is before the Max, <laughs> and what was it, Zach? That the the airline pilots love the uh, Boeing over the Airbus, but the airlines like the Airbus over the Boeing, and the, air, the pilots can fly the Boeing airplanes, and they love that. Versus the Airbus, they have these little joysticks. I could be mixing them up, and the airlines love that because it's completely automated and it saves them a lot more gas when it's automated, right? Because the human flying the plane is gonna be more wasteful, right? So this is, this is where we can set up programs that can dictate ethics and technology development and how that interfaces with humans, but then we always have to, someone needs to update it appropriately because it can go crazy, right? Mm, We've seen uh, enough movies. Yeah, I would like to add a little bit on both of those uh, comments. Uh, because actually I think technology already uh, is changing our um, ethics, ethical standards and morality. Uh, I fully agree with this statement that uh, we cannot rely on our own consciousness because uh, it's something what we learn. And in the past uh, we were more enclosed in the, in the small communities, yeah? uh, where the rules were set, they were pretty stable over the time. Uh, and uh, with all this technology we have right now, we have an access to much bigger communities uh, with multiple different standards. Uh, we can make choices. What do we want to believe in? What do we don't want to believe in? We can see many different ethical systems. Uh, some of them are contradictory. Um, and uh, it is already changing our point of view. It also accelerates a lot of things, yeah, because uh, due to this easy information flow, we can combine many different uh, solutions, technologies uh, to solve bigger problems. Uh, but also, I think it shapes our, our uh, moral standards. I think I agree with you in the sense that, <clears throat> that you know, as I said earlier, you, 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 you can just look at the negative side of all of this sort of stuff. You could, you could say the Me Too movement was negative, but actually these things have moved things that, that should have been shifted into, into positive places, the, the bright side and so on. So I think that a lot of the technology is in fact revealing issues that we should have dealt with before and hadn't. Mm -hmm. And in that sense is a good thing. The only, the only places where I get worried about it is, is about the, the loneliness, the connectivity, it's supposed to connect you well it does but at a remove unless you're very careful and use it to then go and meet people and it's the connection with people um, at, a, at a very much more intimate level that I think is, is just my view is important John did you have a point John Doyle yeah I was gonna say something sort of based kind of riffing off my talk yesterday which is one of the issues that that it's transcending everything that people saying is intrinsic features of layered architectures. So if you take, if you take cells, bacteria can swap genes willy-nilly. We can do re gene recombination when we reproduce, and it all sort of works, uh, which is quite remarkable. But then viruses can hijack that same layered architecture to put their genes in. We talk about mimetics, so we have language, and so I can come down here from Caltech and just take for granted that I can 
talk, 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 and people understand me. I can plug in my laptop and my PowerPoint slides work. And so we have all these layered architectures. And what they make is all this fantastic plug and play. Um, we have that with language. We have this with, uh, with the power grid. We have all these, all of our technology like that. But they hide all the details. And one of the details they hide is that none of this is sustainable. I talked about it a little bit yesterday. So they, we, we completely hide where our power comes from. We completely hide where our food go, comes from. We completely hide from our con, you know, everyday use um, where all the waste goes. Um, but also, uh, we c sort of completely hide all the mechanisms that make language possible. So we, you know, the, not just the phoneme generation and consumption, but, uh, but syntax and grammar, and unfortunately, fact checking is pretty much automatic and unconscious. And so, so the same technologies that make everything so wonderful make things horrible. <laughs> and, and it's shocking how little attention is paid to in the, in the design of the architectures to these features. And it used to be the one place you could trust that people knew how to do this was commercial aircraft. And we don't even have that anymore. And so it's really quite, it's quite frightening. Um, and I, you know, I used to, you know, wouldn't matter Airbus or Boeing, you got on a plane, the next few hours was the safest part of your day. Because yep. planes just, you know, you had to, I mean, the 777, went for a decade with no deaths. The first death was they got shot down from a surface to air missile in Ukraine, right? And we're just, and the thing is we're losing that. And because the, one of the things these layered architectures let us do is just build ever faster, ever more virtualized infrastructures. And, and so, so that, I think it's one of the, if we want to get a deep understanding of this, we've got to understand these intrinsic trade-offs and start thinking about the design of the, of the bad side effects before we get them as a surprise. Yeah. Isn't that a function of capitalism, though? Oh, God, just, yeah. But, but it's not, the problem is, you know, <laughs> yeah, let's not. Okay. So I, think, <laughs> I think the problem is <laughs> ethics and economics and stuff like that. Um, all I think can be thought of this way, um, but it's really complicated. We had a discussion at lunch where, um, the, for the last 10,000 years, there really haven't been any decent human societies. And so, and you can ask, are there any in the animal kingdom? And yeah, there's like three. <laughs> and all the rest of them are just, you know, red and tooth and claw. But there's three, and if you look at those, like the elephants, the bonobos, and the orcas, they give you a blueprint for how you could build a social architecture that actually worked for the benefit of everybody. But we're so far from that. We're chimp world with guns. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts? Well, okay. Just the, uh, the bonobos needed the gorillas to go extinct south of the Congo River for their society to develop. And, so. and, yeah, they need the big, oh, yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. You, you had your hand up. To keep the chips away from the bonobos. Um, so this has been great. Um, and um, <laughs> to talk about good and bad, morality, I guess, with um, I guess how we behave, uh, also good and bad of technology that has been fantastic. Uh, but I'd like us to get back to um, uh, the theme of the workshop and the symposium, which can also be framed as the good and the bad of technology and other or traditional clinical approaches, right, to our health and wellness, right? And despite great advances in technology and despite humongous investments in healthcare, trillions, I mean, huge amounts of money, right? So the health outcomes are not necessarily improving. In fact, they're going down in highly developed countries like here in the United States, right? So something is going, uh, something is wrong here, right? Um, and um, so this good and bad duality here, uh, I would like the panel to comment on how can we take those fantastic technological advances or modes of operation of technology advances and bring them closer to health and wellness. And from the other side, how can we take those, I guess, um, great inspiration from 3,000, 4,000 years ago, right, of, of how to live and because wellness from the perspective of meditation, right? And how can we couple that also with today's technologies, right? So if there's a middle ground and how can we have those two extremes come together in getting us to be healthier and better. 
Oh, well, um, so let me just start by saying this notion, uh, this new field of contemplative neuroscience, this new field of studying meditation and other um, contemplative practices and, and as it relates to health, would not exist today if it wasn't for the advent of functional MRI. We tried this in the 70s. It hit a wall. The re scientists started to drink the Kool-Aid and became unbiased and started to promote their religious, their, their, their zealot dogma. For 4,500 years or so, these practitioners have been telling us, hey, mindfulness meditation practice does X, Y, Z. But we always cast it as um, these romantic, emotionally attached, placebo-related uh, notions of sitting in meditation for 14 hours a day your whole life. Of course you're going to think it's going to make you feel better, etc. But now we have the advent of neuroimaging and other physiological uh, methodologies that are more objective. And we can correlate these with behavior improvements and health improvements, health outcomes. And that, I believe, is what's advanced the field of contemplative neuroscience because we can now actually verify what these guys have been saying for so long. And I think we're at a peak, we're at a position now where we must be careful by using whatever application we want to use to get into a meditative state, by controlling the expectations that we might have of what one should expect when practicing and balance that with utilizing that objectivity with technology. Because if that application is going to help me to sit for five, ten minutes so that I don't react when I'm in rush hour traffic for my own health and someone else's health, then great. But if, I'm, if it's going to render me to be just as addicted and attached, which is the antithesis of the practice, then it's, fruit, it, then it's futile and then it's maladaptive. So in real, I don't know how to balance that. It comes down to the individual. But the beauty of the practice is that you don't need the technology. You could just sit and sit with the breath. How, but, but how long do you think it'll be before somebody has a wearable or something that teaches you how to be, breathe slowly better? I think we're there. I think there's applications that do that. Well, but that then, idea. Roger, do you need that application? Do you need that application to elicit the practice reliably? Do you need the application to show you the graph moving up and down that you're supposed to match with your respiration rate? You see, does, is there, at what point does the technology become the problem? You know, and that's something I have no, we've talked about. In great detail. But there were probably yeah. other answers to Gert's question anyway. But do you want to add anything as we go Yes, along? so talking about, um, so for instance, there, this, there was this concept. This was 10 years ago. There was a huge rage of wireless health. And you think of it as really a misnomer. Does wireless make us more healthy? Being in the middle of radiation, right? if you put your cell phone right next to your ear, does it make your brain healthier? Well, clearly there's now some evidence that this is definitely dangerous thing to do, right? Um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, we have, I have people from, formerly from Qualcomm. They can, can <laughs> so, so the point it's I want to make is that... your fault. No, no. <laughs> well, the, 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 well the, the point I want to make is that, yeah, technology has always an upside and a downside. But it's also, and that, that's, I guess, the challenge I also want to throw out to the community, right, is, is that... Uh, technologists should be more aware of the consequences of what they do, what they build, and also look on the other side of, of right, um, other aspects, cognition, mind, right, and, and not think in a very linear or, or simple reductionist fashion, right. And conversely, mm -hmm. the, um, um, the meditators, the mindful community should also uh, find means to use technology in a more, in a positive fashion. Mm -hmm. So, I would like to comment on what you said and connect with what you're saying. So, the, the health outcomes in the United States, it's actually by model. If you look at the people who have health care, Cadillac insurance, everything, the, the outcomes are much, much higher than other developed countries. But once you average it, then it becomes, uh, we fall below Cuba, for instance, which spends... 10 times less. But 
we tend to get enamored with technology, and I do not know if we can blame the technologists, because all engineers take this position that we will build it and they will come. So if, if we are going to go, instead of following this simple thing of just sit there, close your eyes, concentrate on breathing, if you want a wearable, yeah, there are people like me who will build the wearable and sell it to you for $399. But do you need it, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I just want to make one last comment, my pet peeve, and, and uh, close, and that is with respect to wireless health or any technology. I believe after 10 years of soul searching is technology is necessary but not sufficient. And if we look at some of the real issues, at least in American um, healthcare system, one of the things experts tell me is the transfer of knowledge from experts like you to the ground level, like, like the primary care. There isn't a good mechanism of teaching medical students that knowledge. And, and as I was struggling with that, I, was, I, I found a, a, a clue in economics. Um, in 1976, there was a seminal paper in, in economics by Darby and Carney, and they talk about <clears throat> credence goods. So you have ordinary goods like your toothpaste or apple, you just automatically go. There is a nice equilibrium between supply and demand. Then there are search goods like your iPhone, your computer, your car. You can go search the manufacturer, gives you all the facts because he wants you to buy that. Then there are experienced goods, like a nice bottle of wine or a vacation, and with a little bit longer latency, they get into equilibrium. The one that they talked about, the credence goods, is you have no idea what you have consumed, and even after you have consumed, you do not know the value if you have been taken for a ride, like appendix. They use a lot of examples from medicine and some examples from automobiles and taxi drivers, and, and these are credence goods. There is this huge asymmetry between the people who have the knowledge and the people who are consuming. They, they know very, very mm -hmm. little, and, and that's really where the healthcare problems come in. The primary care people do not know the real research, the evidence-based medicine, um, all of that stuff. But if you take a look at the self-driving cars or GPS that you talked about, yeah. okay? The cell phone got into GPS around 2004. Ten years later, you had Uber and other dry services. So the technology has made a credence good, like a taxi driver, in, into a, an ordinary good. You right. know, you don't worry about it. You just right. pick up your phone and you, you're sure Uber will never cheat you. Right? right? So maybe we can do something like that for, for medicine. Convert it from a credence good to an ordinary good. So or something you, else. You had your hand up as well. Do you, can we just take you afterwards then? Yeah. Uh, I want to mention two things. First of all, your presentation, uh, I thought that is, uh, go back to the Asian proverbs. Going back to the old things, we can find a new idea. The meditation is from Asia countries. And you find something very new. Yeah, very good job, I thought. And second thing uh, you mentioned, we have to respect many uh, other people. And here, many people are top scientists, maybe. I'm not. I want to be a top science idea to transfer to the much lower level of the ed not very educated people. But I want to tell them what they are finding to the much easy world. And I try to go to the international conference to attend it all from my pocket. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard, but I try to do. Brother, well done. <laughs> yes, yes.
Could I comment? Oh, these are. I wanted to continue on the question, unless there's a. Is it a new thread or is it the same thread? It's related to Gert's question, but and related to what you were saying, if I may briefly. Um, I think there's this there's this one thing I just want to point out about what we're we're, all, we're we're sort of assuming that somehow we have a choice in whether or not technology continues to progress, and I think I want to rectify this assumption, at least in my view. This, this, we use words like "should we allow technology to continue to go on?" Like Ludditism has never it worked out in any version of humanity back to the beginning of history. Right. Um, technology is what humans do. I believe technology is part of our evolutionary biology. It is an extension of our biology. And so technology is a way that humans have adapted tools to terraform our environments, to carve out our own niches and preserve our, our species. We will continue to use tech. So I, I guess that's, that's just one thing that I think we often throw this word, this, we, we kind of assume that somehow we can, we can not do the tech. When it comes down to whether, like how we use tech, um, I think the question that you're you're posing about, um, <clears throat> you know, with the, uh, with medicine improving in certain areas, but also maybe asymptoting in other areas, I think one of the key things is looking is that we need to do is look at more more at whole systems causal mechanisms. So often it's it, as you, as a system becomes increasingly more complex, as anybody who's studied control theory or causality, identifying the actual causal prima facie causes in the system becomes more difficult. As these systems get loopy, causation, it's very difficult to establish what are the actual causal factors. And when we look at medicine, I think everyone, you know, a common criticism of Western medicine is it's essentially symptomatically, it's basically treating symptoms in many cases. Uh, rather than identifying the actual causal mechanisms. Examples might be like fibromyalgia syndrome, catch-all for chronic pain that may have inflammation as a cause or a dozen other things, and yet you would treat it by maybe taking a painkiller. Um, actually getting back to really using machine learning, using massive quantities of disparate data from many different domains, brain, body, social, you know, basically aggregating as much knowledge as we can about a person in the context of their environment and putting that into our sophisticated, you know, computing systems that can now try to identify what likely are the causes for why somebody ends up with disease X or disorder Y. I think that's going to lead to the big breakthroughs in um, actually, the, the other thing, preventative medicine. So I can now have, you know, at age 15, I can have a predictive model that's starting to already say these are the possible outcomes that could happen in when I'm 35 or 36 and so, take these lifestyle choices that will make that very improbable and so on and so forth all the way, you know, till the end of your life. I mean, what Mattel's is doing actually, yeah, I was just going to shout out to what he's doing with Predict Watch. It's very interesting in that regard too yeah. with mental health. This is very interesting what you said and also it relates to the uh, previous topic we had here. Uh, but in the in the smaller temporal scale, it's it's a problem we have with addiction, yeah, that we want to be able to prevent relapse way ahead it happens, yeah. And um, to do that, we need to be able to assess a lot of different variables. Uh, and this is a problem for our brain uh, to, to, to take in account all these variables. Because usually, you know, if let's say that I'm an alcohol addict, yeah, and I got drunk uh, today or yesterday, and I see only the most, uh, the, the latest reason, or even maybe it's, it may be not a real reason why I got drunk, but this is something what I think about. Uh, that I had an argument with my wife, for example, and that's why I, I, I had to drink, yeah? But there was like multiple, and on the, with the big data, we can see that there are multiple uh, ca causes which accumulates over time. Someone may have decreased uh, amount of sleep over the last two weeks, for example, then uh, bad mood and a lot of stress at work during the last few days. And then at the end, uh, less physical activity, which was a good stress reliever, but it didn't work because, I don't know, there was no time or uh, something else. And those complex uh, patterns uh, contribute to some very observable behavior, like relapse at the end. But for the brain of addict, it's impossible to capture it. Uh, there's too many variables. They are, we, we, we cannot remember all these things which happens over the long time. Uh, we, we are not able to predict our uh, health choices in the terms of years because it's, it's too much, yeah? And for that, we need some machine learning, artificial intelligence, 
uh, in the classic uh, addiction treatment, uh, people have a sponsor in 12-step program, someone who is like this external brain observing, uh, but it's another human being, yeah? Our therapist with whom you talk every week and so on, or the diary, uh, but it's hard to extract all the necessary information from that. And here uh, we come back to this issue, okay, to what extent we can let those AIs uh, or, you know, like mm. bigger mm. things mm. take control over our health? What's uh, the partnership? To what extent do we want? Yeah. What's yeah. the partnership? Yeah. Exactly. What's the partnership? I would, like to, I would like to quickly comment <laughs> on um, the uh, preventive medicine aspect, the, the follow-up on preventive medicine and circling back to Gert's question, is there a middle ground? I think the middle ground of um, you know good and bad of the technology lies in the preventive medicine and medicine in general that um, some of the health outcomes if you take diabetes obesity I mean a lot of the uh, societies are looking into prevention right now and if we were to tie this to technology with uh, wearables that if we were to uh, give someone a very accurate tracking of their um, blood sugar, of their physical activity, of their sleep, uh, lots of these parameters that they can uh, monitor themselves, then they, that could lead to change in behavior and preventive medicine. And um, we work with a behavioral group at Northwestern in one of our NIH-funded projects, and uh, sure enough, in the literature, uh, Self-monitoring is the most efficient way, demonstrated way, of changing behavior. So I think that um, we can really leverage this, this nanotechnology, not just relying on how my wrist moves, that's going to tell me how I sleep, but beyond that, with all the, all the fantastic work we've seen over here, uh, that we, if we can make this uh, at a customer level, uh, individual level, that people can monitor their, um, their electrolytes, their, their glucose, and uh, all of that, then they can uh, help themselves at the individual level for healthcare. Right, now we're going to go here. However, with just one comment, which is that the self... The se I guess it's done. <laughs> no, the self, the self-monitoring, I remember seeing a graph, it was from some of you, one of you was companies or something, do, do not answer though, which showed quite clearly that looking on a laptop was far less efficient than looking on a cell phone was far less efficient than looking on a wearable. The wearable was the most looked at. It was like 82% or something as opposed to... It was yours, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, Please what I was going to tell <laughs> has been widely covered. The most important thing is education, education, education. In this country, when I go to the doctor, they measure my blood pressure and they give pills, pills, pills. None of them tell me that I have to lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, <laughs> walk, exercise. So it's driven by farm industry-based medical. We are... We will start new medical school at University of Houston. It's preventative medicine-based medical school. And it's, I'm part of it. I'm the one of the person involved. I think it's going to really transform our health care in a different way. Mm -hmm. okay? So the, when I go to doctor in Sweden, first they look at you are 200 pounds and your height 165, you should be the 130 pounds and you need to more exercise and something before prescribing medication. Mm -hmm. The second issue, these medications, many of them are, if people are desperate, they have to use it, it's very important, but it's, they're fixing something, also they're destroying something else. All my friends, they are using blood pressure medication, they have some side effects. So they, it's, they need to be something else. I'm not, I don't have any solution, but I'm just saying that mm -hmm. it's, we need to, First, we must care about the people. Second, about the finance, profits part. And also, don't, if you're not testing the drugs in the US, please don't test in India or developing countries because they have a relaxed rules. That way you can get better data and check. That's terrible. Final comments. To me, it's most important with healthcare impact on the society. Two parts important. One is quality of the healthcare, Second is the cost of the healthcare. We are developing technologies if they are expensive, if they are not affordable, if the half of the population cannot access. In my view, that's not a good technology. 
it needs to be price needs to be affordable by the general public, either co-sponsored by government or somebody else. It needs to be cheaper. We engineers, of course, we are in innovators. We transform the medicine more than many other fields in a way that I mean that I mean that chemists, physicists, engineers. We are all innovators. If you go to any doctor's office, 95% of things are designed envisioned, implemented by the physicists, chemists, electrical engineers, biomedical engineers. But the, if you look at the cost of the healthcare, every year healthcare cost is going up. We need to do something on this. Thank you. Sir. Okay. <coughs> the, um... John before said something about capitalism, and Fardel said, I, I would like to know if what he said can actually happen in a capitalistic society. But anyway, sorry, didn't mean yes, to interrupt. The, the, the other thing is... The, you, <laughs> if you buy the blood pressure medication, you need to only pay $15. In the United States, if you don't have insurance, you have to pay $300. All right. But Switzerland's so, also the only country in the world that has a direct democracy and is radically different. Back from, uh, what you're talking about, by the way, and, and the fields you w work in, um, I mean, just limiting it to a small number, is um, you're talking about diet, you're talking about sleep, you're talking about um, meditation. Exercise. Um, exercise. <laughs> but these, these are all things that actually can be usefully have a metric attached to them so that you have feedback. So, I mean, well, yes, obviously. I mean, uh, you had your... Standards, standards, standards for interoperability between different yeah. devices that acquire this kind of data is essential. And yes. IEEE actually has been central to these efforts and are doing this with neurotechnology, for instance. Also right. invasiveness. Could you come over Am I right? So I mean, some of these talks that, we've, that I've been seeing across time, especially coming out of UCSD, um, is lack of invas invasive measurements, right? I mean, it's not... It's not practical to get people scanned in, a, in, a, in an MRI. But if they could have a non-invasive, non-radiating kind of wearable, or even a diagnostic when you go to the doctor, right, that's not invasive, not an x-ray, um, this is, the way, this is I think, where ethics can be put aside in a sense, because it's not a, even an ethical question. It's can we get better at capturing cancer, heart disease, blood pressure, even before it happens? And this is where big data comes into play, right? Predictability. What kind of, um, you know, I don't have to get into what, what I mean by predictability. So this, this data to me is an incredibly um, exciting venture uh, that a lot of the folks here, I know TP as well, is doing some really cool stuff with that where um, we can kind of get at advancing medicine for the well-being, uh, psychological and physical well-being of, of, of people, right? Um, so, right. And sorry, Mary, I'm going to just jump back to, to, to the point that he was talking about. And the economic point? Or the yeah, kind of. The, the thing is that uh, I, I feel that the scientific community has been working very hard lately, and, you know, trying to push new changes that can really change the quality of life of many people. Right. But we're kind of hitting a barrier. You know, it's like we have political barriers that are, are, are preventing that those, those great discoveries make a change in the life of people. Nice. And we come here, we present our work, I mean, it's super cool, but then what's gonna happen? I mean, it's always dying in the same wall. So and, and I don't think it's, a pro it's an intrinsic problem of capitalism. It's the problem of, of, of the, the science and the politics are handled in this country. Because if you go to Germany, if you go to Switzerland, some of these Scandinavian countries, you know, the reality with the healthcare is completely different. You know, if you go to a super, Poor country like Cuba, for example, they spend like almost no money on, on, on healthcare, and the quality might be actually better than, than the than the healthcare that you can get in this country, where many people cannot get access to, to healthcare. Right. But we have the best biomedical research enterprise for here. Whom? I think for ninety for ninety whom? percent of the people in this room are immigrants. But for whom? For, for those who can pay for that, right? Not for those people who have, who have to handle like, three you, jobs. Listen, you're right. You're right. If if somebody at UCSD discovers a drug. Okay, that, that's funded by the taxpayers. That drug is not available for free because it was funded by taxpayers. No, that individual goes across the street 
and finds a pharmaceutical company and makes a billion bucks off of it. Which and is, that's the problem. That should awful. be illegal. It's quite awful. Frankly. And then that, that's the thing. Then it's, it's very nice, and maybe it's not our work to but focus. We, we f sorry for interrupting you, but this yeah. country, and don't get me to defend this country, but this country does fund more biomedical research than any other country. Okay, I want to see that reflected in the life and in the healthcare that normal people get in this country. That's not going to happen. It's not happening. Yeah, I think it's, it's just a question of value alignment, yeah, yeah. which is intrinsically <laughs> no, a problem in any comp. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just I'm just teasing the, the discussion because we need to jump out of, all over that. So it's not like, yeah, we're discovering cool things, but where are those things taking us over? Well, but we're getting better at it because yeah. I think there's been a movement, especially in light of how fast information is processing some aspects <clears throat> of social media, where a lot of the code, a lot of the technologies are being made open source. In fact, that's a lot, a lot of the labs I'm working with, that's, that's, part, that's rule number one. You make everything publicly available from the technology to the code to the papers, etc. But okay. yes, we can't do anything about GlaxoWellcome and Pfizer and the spinal cord stimulating companies. Those guys, I, we can't do anything about that. I just want to, I agree with the numbers that we spent. 1.5 trillion dollars 2017 0.5 trillion dollars in the areas of medical devices 1 trillion dollars in the areas of biopharm science and engineering and no, none of the country in the world even close to these numbers now what i hadn't finished off saying before when i was listing all those things <laughs> no the other things are addiction Loneliness and anxiety. These come up all the time whenever I'm talking, day. certainly to the people, kids on campus and so on. What are you doing about that? I think one of the ways that um, to, to facilitate the access to healthcare providers is taking advantage of the technologies, telemedicine, which is really uh, trying to spread in various areas of medicine that you don't necessarily have to wait months and months to get a clinic appointment, but you, you can get access uh, right then and there, uh, even utilizing smartphone devices to communicate with some of your healthcare providers through various apps. For example, for in the addiction platform, I think they have it some, some of it in the depression uh, field as well. So. I think that this is one angle that should be also further developed that will decrease the healthcare costs as well in some ways uh, economically. Also, I'm talking too much, I know. I think something that uh, the three species of nice animals, which also dolphins are pretty awesome. Can, I, can we get some love for dolphins? Okay. Um, is is love thank, for, you. Love for dolphins. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love some, them too. Some dolphin. Um, is empathy, loneliness, addiction, the, caring for each other, these animals share that too. And can we, we have a new $150 million institute to study compassion and empathy cultivation, right, here at UCSD? Really? Can we, sorry? We have such an institute here? We do. Yeah, yeah Bill, it's Bill Mobley's the director. He was here. Which yeah. one? <laughs> oh, yeah. this one? Yeah, this one. Oh. So, I think one thing that we're also interested in is can we develop technology that can elicit compassion training, empathy? Because if we can do that and, not, and feel compassion and empathy for ourselves, then we can extend that to everyone, to everyone, to, to where the, right, the idea is, to, and that's why people, the, the purpose of mindfulness, actually that mental training is to cultivate that compassion where you can love the stranger on the street as much as your mother. And then we could take care of each other. And I don't want to start, you know, I don't know if there's going to be like some classical music playing right now or something, but that's not too far-fetched for us. And if we could find some technology or interfaces that can elicit this more easily, more pragmatically, then, I, then that's, I believe, one step closer at assuaging what you're talking about, Roger. If I can it. shout out on that to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but there's actually a, a a whole conference dedicated to exactly that topic, the Transformative Technologies Conference held in Palo Alto every year. This is in the heart of Silicon Valley for a reason. With, you know, Silicon Valley has not had the best track record of you know, creating a world in which we are really truly connected. Social media is not that. 
Um, but it also has created the technologies that could enable that future. That, uh, you know, my dear friend Nicole Bradford and Jeffrey Martin created this conference that now has, you know, I think they had a thousand people um, across the upper echelons of tech all the way through practitioners thinking about specifically how technology can be used to increase human empathy, increase human connectedness, increase uh, well-being, thriving. Um, so this is something people are deeply interested in in the tech world right now and are working actively towards. So, uh, yeah. But here's let, let a let challenging... Me, let me just interject one thing there we, just before we forget it. This is the New Yorker for August the 19th, 2019. And I recommend that you read it, the actual, yeah, August 26th, sorry, August 26th, 2019. And the issue is, it, the title is Silicon Valley's Crisis of Conscience. And it's a very interesting piece. Maybe this conference is a bit of a redemption attempt in the Valley, but, um, but I think people genuinely in the Valley, including many VCs, do want to do the right thing. It's not clear what the right, the right thing, thing is, is to do. Right. Right. We have to collectively understand that. Right. Right. On the flip side of things, it's very hard to connect to the person or feel compassion for on the street or in an elevator or in a restaurant when you see all these people looking down. That's right. exactly. So it's very hard to say hello to someone these days because everybody's busy. I mean, raise your hand how many times you've seen two people sitting on the same table at a dinner table in a restaurant on their phone. So I think that this is also the flip side of things. So we have to be careful how technology well, can connect people and separate people or make them feel lonely. Well, it's possible to do it. As some, some of you know that I've been sort of doing lots of walking for the last year and a half. And when I first started, everybody I walked past was just looking down or averted <laughs> their eyes. But I now am happy to say that when I'm out walking, I got lots of people waving but You have and pretty saying visible hi. clothes. You're a very famous right. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. We, no, we just, need to spread this California wave just, to all across the country. Just then. connecting, that's all. <laughs> Leaf, you've got a, your hand waving there. And Rachel, do you still have your question? We'll pass it to him, uh, to Rachel after you've done. Yeah, thanks. Men first. <laughs> it seems to me that a lot of this comes back to the idea of motivation and brain structures that are involved in motivation, such as basal ganglia and the dopamine reward system. So I'm wondering about how to harness that. And for example, if the gaming industry has figured out how to maximize reward activation in the brain, and and looking at the analogy of gateway drugs, can we go the other direction? Could there be gateway games, gate, something that's fun that would enable you to take the right steps? Because I think the majority of people want to thrive, and part of the problem is they don't know how to. They don't know the steps that need to be taken. Part of it's access to the right technologies, being able to afford it. But part of it's motivation taking those first steps. And so if there are technologies that could st get people started in the right directions, a lot of the behavioral patterns are pretty simple and not necessarily expensive. Yes, is the answer to that. And there are people doing exactly that. Um, you know, one, just one example is a company called Warmly, uh, created by my friend Jason Asbear, who developed games for many years an industry and now wants to create mobile augmented reality games that can empower children to learn empathy, to learn how to meditate, but not doing it in a way that's like, oh, let's go and like learn this task. It's like, let's use all that reward circuitry that, you know, these other games like are, are you know, harnessing and utilizing, but directing that towards learning practical skills that will eventually help you become a better person. Um, you know, yeah, you can't compel somebody to sit there and like read the Bhagavad Gita at the age of nine, unless you grew up in India or something. But, uh, but you can teach them about empathy um, in ways that still involve competition and points and stuff. But underneath that, you're learning that in order to win, you actually have to collaborate. So, yeah. Agree. Um, Thank you. So, so I, I'd just like to argue that there already is a major tool for teaching empathy that's gotten a big boost from technology and that's storytelling. The fact that because of all of the ways that we have access to stories, whether it be 
reading, news, social media, movies, television, that we've seen a big boost in like acceptance and open-mindedness to different groups of people in society because now you have, have the ability to read, watch, listen to the story of someone who you would have never thought what it was like to be in their mind before. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful mechanism. It doesn't necessarily have to be some new technology. I, I, I think that this is something really powerful that we harness all the time. Um, but doesn't that mean that you're alone? <laughs> when you're doing any of these things. Um, Storytelling yeah. is a group thing. You, you tell people, I really yeah. like what you said. It's, it's not an alone thing. It's, it's, you, you're with people. In, in storytelling. I'm not sure that's well, what you were saying. But, but there is many, <laughs> many ways of uh, storytelling these days. So when you watch the Netflix, it's a storytelling too, yeah? Uh, but you might do it completely alone. You had a second point? Well, um, my, my second point is um, more of a negative uh, one, and that's with all of these things that... Well, the first thing that was brought up about video games and that video games are being designed to... Um, essentially take away your ability to do anything else or to have the free will to choose to not do them. Um, I think this is a really troubling thing, but it also shouldn't have been as surprising to me as it was because advertising companies have always as wanted to make things more appealing and, um, and will use whatever information they have, just like any other person, um, to do that, to persuade people uh, um, and they're just, they have more information now. They're just getting better at it, but it's the same goal um, that they've always had. And so when we talk about all of these monitoring things um, that can really help people, um, unfortunately, the reality in our society is that when you're able to monitor something and about yourself on a device like a smartphone, so are the providers of those technologies is, um, and they're going to use that to their advantage in some cases to um, take away your free will. So how, what do we do about that? What, what is, is the balance there? Take uh, away your what? What? Take away your what? Free you will. Free will, okay. Right. Um, your ability <laughs> to choose whether or not you should buy something, watch something, pay attention to something. How do they do that? Um, well, so um, it's become common knowledge like um, well, first of all, what sh the input that you give to that thing, whether, oh, I enjoyed this video or I, I didn't enjoy this video, uh, will then determine what advertisements you see. They can predict from whether or not you like a certain song on Pandora what your political affiliation is. As, um, and so that's one thing. Another thing is that <coughs> all of these things that listen to, to, to you and are able to, when you're able to say, hey, Alexa, now that you have that ability, you know that that thing has a microphone that's turned on all of the time, and Amazon uses that information, and Amazon's goal is to make as much money off of you as possible, and so now they're going to be giving you products, recommendations, advertisements um, that are going to, s to sell you things based on the information that you've given it from whatever platform, which in some ways helps you, but in other ways is maybe doing these things and, um, to influence the way that your brain is making decisions. I have an answer to your question. Throw a blockchain on it. No, I'm joking. Uh, we use this term, like throw a deep neural network on it, throw a blockchain on it, they'll solve everything. But um, no, but the reason I mentioned blockchain, uh, decentralized systems are one of those ways that are now hitting you know, decentralized technological systems, like for instance, blockchain technologies, that allow you to preserve sovereignty of your data in ways that still allow companies to be able to monetize that data if you choose to allow them to, but give you guaranteed ability to track how your data is being used, where it's being used, and turn on or off those controls for in perpetuity. Um, those kinds of systems typically, right now, they, they don't exist. Like once you, when you use Facebook, your data now lives in Facebook servers. I can now tell Facebook I don't want you to use my data anymore, but there is no guarantee that my data has not, is not still being used, has not already been used to target me. Um, being able to trace and track how your data is used, who gets access to it, and then selectively decide what do I want to give up in terms of 
my privacy or in terms of how I'm targeted in exchange for services is the key to the new economies, I think, of data of the future. And a lot of people are thinking about that. And then the second thing I would say is with sovereignty comes stewardship, another great S word. Sovereignty you know, applies to the individual, like preserving your sovereignty. Stewardship is something companies have to adopt, which is the sense that they are building technologies and they are stewards of that technology, and they have to think about how they architect their systems to preserve the things that we value, like sovereignty, agency, et cetera. And just like stewards of our planet is something we've forgotten how to be, stewards of privacy and agent, and I don't want to use the word privacy too much because a lot of people have different views on whether privacy is valuable and necessary. Some people don't care about surveillance, Seuss valence, or any other valence, and some people care a lot. <laughs> but, um, but thinking about um, things like agency, et cetera, and making sure that you're stewards of autonomy and the, and the right for people to be able to know how their data is being used and how they're being manipulated, that's something that every company, every tech company should build into their charter. And we're at Intheon thinking, for instance, a lot about that when it comes to neurotech. Yanina? Yeah. Um, a comment. Uh, so considering the fact that only three species, uh, apparently, are um, kind of benevolent and empathetic, and the others are worrying, and uh, using every evolutionary advanced and developed technique for unfair dominance over the others. We have a very high and steep slope um, in our conscious society, storytelling, uh, information driven, to resist uh, the evolution that made us. And um, there's very, there, the two um, books that probably some of you read that um, are very deeply addressing these um, in the last few years. Um, one's probably well known, Homo Deus uh, by Ival Harari. Harari, right? And the second one is called Overstory by Richard Powers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in so many pages, I, I, I'd say it's a profound read and a very deep dive into conversation we're having. Yeah, they, those are great books. Um, another one, we're, roll, we're rolling towards an end here. We're supposed to close. Gert, are we supposed to finish at 3.30 or what? Your call. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just stay here. I was yeah. interested just to touch on something even a little bit broader, and so this is already <clears throat> wonderfully broad. But we, we've come back a number of times to the dangers of capitalism. And I agree. It's very scary what the dark side of capitalism can be. But we also know the power of regulated capitalism in the context of a democracy. And so just, again, going very broad, are there ways that similar technologies could be used to augment democracy? I mean, we have this great opportunity through the interconnectedness of the Internet. There's a dark side, but there are also potential ways that that could help our politics if we could only figure out how. Uh, just get rid of the Electoral College. <laughs> <laughs> and throw a blockchain on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now you can, there are lots of people talking about blockchain-based direct democracy systems. It's unclear whether that kind of a system scales to 400 million individual humans. There's never been an experiment to try to scale direct democracy to that size. We may need completely new uh, political systems. I, I don't think it's the number of people. I think it's more of American psyche. Like, if you look at just the healthcare system, the way pharma developed, the way American Medical Association controls the education, all of those things, you don't see them in Germany, UK, Australia, India. So it's, 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 it's a unique thing, the, the American psyche. Uh, it's different from the rest of the world. So it's more about the politics, the politicians, and who we choose to put there, because they have been controlling at least the healthcare for the last 100 years in, in, in ways that you would be surprised. You would be shocked. Well, Hamid, and then Tristan, and then I think we have to close because...
recital has to go. I don't, I, well, I mean, the panel I, can still exist. Well, we have to change, there's <laughs> no, there's a, we changed to another panel at some point. Is there another, isn't there another panel? There is another oh, panel, yeah. So we're supposed yeah. to start at 3.30? Yes, no, we'll be throwing you lot away and getting another one very shortly. <laughs> no, just, but Mohammed. Yeah, just a quick point regarding what Rachel says about the gaming and uh, the addiction that these uh, mobile phones or the games can cause. So, and she was wondering why the providers think how they think about it. So the answer is that they don't think about this and they don't themselves know about this. So I think one of the reasons we have these panels and they are rare is just to understand how engineers, neuroscientists, sociologists know the priorities as one of the audience mentions to know about the priorities, the values and how these technologies can change the values over the time. So what are the effect of them? and how we can make a platform. So we know that it's, a capital, it's capitalism, and you pointed to that, but there are some rules. So for drugs, this is a capitalism country, but we have FDA, so they go through procedure, and then they approve. Because we don't see an object like a mobile phone can be dangerous as heroin or other types of drugs. So we just say that, hey, have a company, make a startup, and then you can have your device, and it's and it solves some of the problems of people. For example, they, they, they know about the rewards pathways of the brain. So they know some um, fantastic things that humans love to do that. And they make a company and they produce that without knowing the effect of that. And because it looks um, um, a not dangerous ac activity, so there is no company, there is no associations to oversee that. And I think one of the solutions to solve the problem, it's good that we give a sample solution from our side, is the NIH and NSF. So those funding companies, those funding organizations, NIH and NSF and NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, they can oversee the funds that they provide, how it's affect, the products affect their life and how they can collaborate. So NSF funds the engineers, NIH, it funds the doctors and uh, it, it funds the medicine part. So their collaboration and their oversee and their committee can solve some of these problems. But right now, the Silicon Valley is somewhere. NIH fund the professors two different worlds. They make the products in their startups. They, make, uh, they assign the fundings to the grant proposals. Z probably very few interactions between them. So I think the source of funding is the place sometimes that can make rules and people must follow the rules because they are get paid from that uh, funding company, a uh, funding organization. Generally speaking, no. those things are, are made public though. If, it's, if you're getting NIH funding and NSF, generally speaking, those findings must be readily available. It is regulated and, and open to the public. And so, so that oversight does occur within those domains. There is no oversight on the research. Once you get oh, your, oh yes, there is. Once you it's get brutal, your, man. The, the, no, the way the way NIH has the, the intellectual freedom to the PIs was there in the NIH mandate right from the beginning. So I do not know. We need to talk offline. I think sure. he needs to go sure. on. Something. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that actually I believe they are really aware of this. The problem in Silicon Valley is like. The, the funding is coming from actually the users, so you need a way to have these users engaged with the system. So the way to do this is having them addicted. Actually, the like button is a way to do so. So you have this reward mechanism. The question is that I don't think we should be against wearables that maybe can help you improve mindfulness, as you were saying, uh, Fadel. The question is also what is our target user? For example, I believe this technology could be really helpful for people that are novice meditators or kids, so how do you motivate them to start uh, learning more about meditation, or how do you help them uh, to connect with people? I, I'm, I also think that another problem is that a lot of people think the technology is making us more lonely, but the research is not that clear. There is actually research um, 
uh, which you're reading about it, there's a study in University of York that is saying actually that it's the opposite way, people that are more engaged in technology, this is a study from 2019, um, they, are, they feel less lonely. It also depends on the age. So if you are between 18 and 22 years old and you use social media, and if you decrease the usage of social media, then it, that increases the, the, um, the effect of loneliness. But it's not for all the ages and all the cases. Like, Skype, WhatsApp, we can communicate at a distance. This is amazing. I can communicate with my family absolutely every day. So that actually really decreases the feeling of loneliness, not for me, for thousands of people around the world. So, um, yeah. And Skype doesn't have side effects. So uh, no, like and, it's, and it's so true. Yeah, no, and we're facilitating our meditation interventions now through Zoom and Skype. Right, where you can have the best teacher ever sitting in Bhutan and you're being catapulted into your living room. This is fantastic. And then if we can engage wearables with that, right? That you can get biofeedback to the teacher to facilitate, to expand the practice that, even more. This is really where it can be exciting in the promotion of well-being. That is also part of the telemedicine that you could even see your patient's blood pressure right. through uh, stethoscopes that are over internet and uh, to make this even further there's oh. now robotic surgeries that could be done say in Chicago in a patient in China uh, using uh, technology so so th there's really a big horizon there so depends on age group though doesn't it but, uh, yeah. but just this is a footnote we, we have to look at it next time before we do our loneliness program that um, sort of Mariam your stories of being back in Armenia and seeing young mothers having very very young children watching something while they were eating was kind of a strange yeah. story anyway Tristan yeah. my, my point is very short it's uh, um, loneliness is often the uh, perversion of privacy and I find that seating arrangements, uh, you know, I often think, where do you go if you want to meet people that's free or fun or, or, uh, or accepting of you and they're not shooing you out and you don't have to essentially pay the meter to stay? So uh, I find hookah bars, uh, kind of a place where I go smoke hookah. And this is traditional across all human, you know, like groups where you can go and smoke. And that's really the only social setting in any city where you're allowed to stay and speak, and the arrangement of the seating is actually designed to meet strangers. Uh, yes, yes, uh, and that's it. So, so all I'm saying is seating arrangement, uh, amphitheater style for the people who love classics and the classical arts, uh, amphitheaters is uh, kind of a solution to loneliness. And it increases uh, spin, spindle complexes. <laughs> right, Roger? And it got us nicely back to the caterpillar smoking the hookah. <laughs> Thank you all for the conversation. And uh, we'll take a break now, and then we're coming back with another panel at 4 o'clock.